There is an inherent paradox in this, and this is what bothers me. While all the cutting edge work is exciting, the gulf between what you have available for the average child in this part of the world and what's available elsewhere, the gulf is enormous. So much of what we talk about, the fine tuning of congenital heart surgery is completely irrelevant in most parts of the world. So there's a difference in approach and there's going to be a, a significant shift as it's already happened in this session from science to social science really. Um, so if you look at the infant mortality rates in the world all over, you can see that there are many parts of the world that are pretty dark and, and that's much of Africa and good parts of India and, and, and there is a considerable amount of variations that you see. Uh, but it's important to recognize that the most of the world, the, the graph below expands the area based on the number of people living there. So for the most of the world, there is very little resources. And there is an incredibly high infant mortality. Especially if you look at Asia, where there is most of the people living, there is considerable variability. And you know, it's without doubt that conflict Zones of conflict have the highest infant mortality, and zones of poor governance also have very high infant mortality. The context is important to talk about infant mortality because um, it's, it's important to recognize that these are areas where pediatric health priorities are different. It's very important to, it's very humbling to see this slide of Sri Lanka. And why I tell you is, they had a very dramatic improvement in infant mortality. They brought it down to the low teens and without any pediatric heart care, no infant heart surgery. So the real priority was focusing on essentials. I know this for a fact because we trained the pediatric cardiologists in Sri Lanka who then set up a wonderful system eventually. And it's important to recognize that it's only when infant mortality goes below 20 that congenital heart disease surfaces. Otherwise, you can't find it. It's drowned in other priorities. It's only when it's about 15% of infant mortality that you start noticing congenital heart disease. Otherwise, you don't notice it. There are bigger priorities. And it's important to recognize that congenital heart disease is not cost effective. A single open heart surgery can complete immunizations in over 100 children, take care of 30 children with pneumonia, over 150 gastroenteritis and midday meals for addressing malnutrition for over 500 children. And it's important to keep this in mind when you talk about the developing world. Notwithstanding all this, there is a large burden of congenital heart disease. And it's the highest in India only because of the fact that we have very high birth rates. Sorry. And obviously, if you look at these are real numbers and these are extrapolated numbers and this is the number that we've come across by just taking it as 33% of all congenital heart disease. So critical congenital heart disease in India and China are substantial. And, and the facilities for looking after them, I would apologize to my Chinese, Chinese colleague, I don't have the numbers from China which you presented eventually, but the situation in India is not very good. The number of pediatric cardiologists, although it's 96 in absolute numbers, is only able to take care of 10% of the disease. And that's the situation in most of the developing world, barring, strangely enough, Sri Lanka that's managed to do it, do very well because their population is relatively small. But elsewhere, this is a huge problem. A majority of children don't get congenital heart surgery. So the essence of looking after children in developing countries, in emerging econom economies, is really to work with limited resources, very limited resources, both human as well as material. And the second, of course, was the challenge of trying to deal with problems that are unique to that region. And again, that was presented so nicely by Dr. Cho. So the question which we are asking here is, what can we learn from India? I just wanted to bring, spend two slides in, in a disclaimer about what is India. India has more contradictions, more variability than Europe within itself. I'm sure to some extent that's true of China as well. So if you look at human development indices, there are parts of India that are doing remarkably well, and there are parts that are doing as poorly as sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, worse. The worst infant mortality is in a district in India, not in sub-Saharan Africa. 
So it's, it's incredibly variable and it's very important to recognize not to make generalization about the region as a whole. And there are, that's very important. So there is tremendous variability in infant mortality. Uh, where I am in Kerala, where congenital heart disease is really surfaced, it's, uh, it's now going to below 10, but where I am sorry. And, but if you look at it elsewhere, it's, it's still pretty high. Although it's rapidly improving, it's still unacceptably high in comparison. So there's tremendous variability, much more so in Europe than in Europe. So the pediatric heart programs have somehow surfaced only in these regions. And they are all private enterprises who've seen the value of investing money, mostly. There are a few charitable hospitals such as mine, but mostly they're private enterprises that sees congenital heart disease as an opportunity to make some money. And that's only happening in those parts of the country that have reasonable human development indices or in metros and not anywhere else. So there are large parts of the country that are exactly like sub-Saharan Africa. And it's, it's something that we live with. We live with contradictions in India, extreme contradictions. So you can see affluence and, and considerable squalor right next to each other. And Yesterday was this fantastic talk, um, and we've, we've, we're very proud of our space program, but at the same time, we have serious issues with basic infrastructure right within our country. And it's important to keep this in mind, and therefore the question has to be rephrased. What can we learn from India? It's very difficult to answer that question. I've changed the question. What can we learn from the experience of selected Indian institutions? And that's the talk, really. I came to Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in 1997, and I saw this, and this is a picture that I took. And I said, yes, I'm going to join this because I saw a commitment from two people who seemed uh, very deeply committed to developing pediatric heart care in a hospital, something that was unheard of. And since they invested in pediatric heart care and they seemed really sincere about it, I chose to join. And we set up a mission in 1998 we established the pediatric heart program with the goals that we provide cost-effective care. That's very important that we had to be cost-effective with results that matched a well-established program in the West. It's a very, very ambitious goal. We said we'll focus on training and teaching. We'll do research looking at our problems that are unique to our part of the world. And this was how it was a couple of years later, uh, soon after I joined. And I think what Essentially, I'm going to summarize here is our experience with trying to deliver pediatric heart care with limited resources. That is essentially what I have to say to the rest of the world. I, I think I have to be very uh, reasonably uh, not so ambitious right now by saying that we've, we've got some, we've learned some lessons. We can share this with the rest of the world, but we've also had failures. We've also have challenges that we have to recognize when we try to address this whole issue. What is limited resources? So if you look at the situation, you can start off with no resources, diagnostic capability, and you've seen the whole spectrum when we talk about Africa. Basic cath lab, older children, infants, newborns, and then everything. And if you look at the global economic pyramid, it's exactly the other way around. The world's population that has access is in this fashion. Essentially, only when you cross $20,000 a year, you can actually talk about comprehensive pediatric card care for every child in the region, whichever way you look at it. <coughs> Essentially, what is limited resources is very relative. What is essential? What would be a luxury? In India, the ultimate status symbol is a BMW. <laughs> but you, know, you can transport yourself in Indian roads as effectively in a car that costs about 1 20th the cost of that, which is down below the famous Tata Nano car, which is, uh, you know, you've heard about it. So you can do that. And in Indian roads, it really doesn't matter. There are potholes anyway. It doesn't make a difference. You're traveling in a BMW, you're more anxious about your car being hit. But you know what? It's not relevant. The question that Indians ask is not, this in, not in this slide. It's in the next slide. And that is what is relevant to India. Even a, an average car is an in incredible luxury item. So it is a very relative point as to what is limited resources. Uh, so if you look at pediatric heart care, human resources are critical, far more critical, in fact, I think, than material resources that come in second. Uh, it's the human resources to develop that is really hard. And, and the limitations in these resources is what we, uh, we uh, experience. 
So an adequate program, in my opinion, is what we have right now in my own center, is that you have pediatric cardiology, pediatric cardiac surgery, and intensive care, and you have basic issues covered by these various wings. An adequate program would take care of 95% of congenital heart disease, in my opinion. Infant and newborn heart surgery, corrective operations, most single, basic single ventricle palliations, not hypoplasts, most catheter interventions, not putting in valves. But this would take care of most of it. That's what we've been doing all along. And it takes care of most acquired conditions. Well, an abundant program is what we aspire for, unfortunately. We want all these fancy things in our own institution so that we can take care of the extra 5% as well. We can do the PLAS, we can do the transplant. And that's like what you see in Boston or maybe in some of the most advanced centers. The key requirements when you want to deliver limited care with limited resources is not so much the strategies. It's more the mindset, the philosophy. The strategies are less important. And the mindset really is in marrying two seemingly opposite contradictory situations. That's affordability and quality. And how do you do that? You have to be willing to deeply connect with the society, with the, to reach out to the average family. Unless you understand, you relate to the average person in the region, you can't do this. Then you have to emerge. We've conditioned ourselves in certain ways, and I'll describe that a little bit. You have to multitask. You have to improvise, innovate, the sexy part. Well, the willingness to connect is very important. We, even in India, we seem to be living in ivory towers. We are tremendously insular. And we have to descend, and we have to be able to work and go into the poorest and actually explore those lives. And that's something that most of us are really not willing to do. And we have to ask some uncomfortable questions. Where do you come from? How long was your travel? What's your source of family livelihood? Who would be influenced by your illness? What's going to happen to the other child at home? And who's looking after them now? Who's paying for your care? So these are questions we don't ask traditionally in India. But once I started to ask these questions, then you get the whole mindset of trying to take care of every child. And we are conditioned, unfortunately, because of the way we have been exposed to teaching medicine and the, the fact that there's just this whole background of extraordinary emphasis on, on looking at progress as if if you do the great operations, if, you do, if you're dealing with the latest technology, then you're making progress. Or progress can be defined as doing uh, a double switch or improving outcomes at any cost, less than 1% mortality, investing a hell of a lot of money on it. But there are many perspectives on progress. It depends on who looks at it. Industry, surgeon, cardiologist, parent, society, government, and you can have each of them to look at it very differently. And you really have to recognize that there are so many of these elements that you need to integrate when you take care of these children. You have to tailor solutions based on socioeconomic realities, and we've had to do that. And one example is balloon valvotomy as an alternative for a BT shunt, or even trying to do newborn tetrapaz is very difficult in our circumstance. We often do a cavopulmonary shunt even in patients who are conduit candidates because we don't do it. We don't have conduits. Another name for conduit is can't do it in our situation, really. <laughs> so, and then you have to multitask. This is the fun part of, the fun part of doing delivering pediatric heart care with limited resources is the fact that you, can, you have to be able to do multiple things at one time. I chose football as a good example, and I learned this whole stuff from my son, who is a football fan. But I remember in, the in 1974, Johan Cruyff was someone who did this brilliantly. He could actually move into multiple positions, and I know he was, he lost, they lost in 1974 to a much more specialized unit uh, in Germany. We, we revere multitaskers. We worship them. And it's, it's, this is an example of an Indian god who multitasks. And a key requirement, really, because extreme res uh, specialization is very resource intensive. When you, when you are extremely specialized, like in football, you need a bigger bench strength. A sort of everybody who specializes want their own pieces, wants their own pieces of equipment, and it becomes really expensive. Here's an example of my colleague who does, uh, who is a classic multitasker. He, um, it's not just because he's the most handsome guy in my department that I'm showing this photograph. But he looks after ICU. He runs our databases. He does echoes. He's a very good interventionist. He does research as well and is responsible for our MRI program. And it's all happened. It's all doable. Because there's so much learning, cross-learning between areas, each domain, 
that he's become extraordinary, and it's doable. These, uh, the other thing uh, which happened this, this morning was very exciting to see multiple modalities of investigation. But I think one has to be reluctant to accept new technology unless there is really major benefit. We are wowed by technology. We find it sexy. 3D Echo is a good example. It's very expensive. It has that minute incremental benefit, but at what cost? Hybrid OR, we all want this, but you know, one person, two person can benefit from hybrid cases. We talk about them a lot in the conference, but it's a very tiny percentage. Robotics is again, it's, they're all white elephants. And the essential thing is to focus, the, the, the focus on essential is sometimes lost. Like for example, if you really take an audit, the biggest problem, we have a, a very big collaborative that we work with, the International Quality Improvement Collaborative for Congenital Heart Surgery. And the biggest problem is infections. And there are simple things that you can do to, to eliminate that. Nurse training is incredibly important, and empowerment of nurses is even more important because it's really rewarding. ICU protocol, surgical checklist, these are basic issues, and they are really, really worthwhile investments. It's important to then document and share the results, and I talked to you about the IQIC. We had to come out with our own journal because it's very difficult to talk about this in Western journals because most Western peer-reviewed journals cannot relate to what we are talking about. So we have to bring up our own forum. And then, of course, there are personal sacrifices that we have to make, uh, which is, again, really essential. And the, the day you start talking to patients deeply, it happens automatically. There are some specific strategies um, that, that we can talk about. I'll try to go through this really quickly. This is an example of a vehicle that's created out of just spare parts. And it works. It's called Jugaad. It's a very famous symbol of Indian innovation. But it, one example is in the cath lab. So we don't do biplanes. We can't afford biplanes. And you can do pretty much 98% of the procedures in, in a single plane. If we get maximum information from ECHO, we can do targeted procedures and do not waste a lot of time. We can share our facility with adult cardiology services so that you don't need a separate cath lab. You re-sterilize. You limit, un we're really careful about what we consume in the cath lab. We think about our hardware, and we use a lot of adult hardware, coronary hardware, guiding catheters, wires, et cetera. We have our own improvisations, which I'll talk to you basically about. And then we have sedation protocols. We don't use anesthesiologists as much as possible, and we train our nurses accordingly. So here's an example of one such innovation that, I, that, that has happened in my own institution. It happened before the PDA devices came into existence and were very expensive. So this allowed us to close nearly 2,000 PDAs at a fraction of the cost of uh, PDA devices at, at equivalent results. So much so we were able to extend this technique to preterm pre infants and we could get it down to as low as 930 grams with reasonable results. Similar strategies for surgery, I, I, I'll quickly go through it because of lack of time. But there's something that I have to talk about, and the specific challenges really lie, lies in our desire to try and do surgeries in everybody, in every difficult situation. Doing it, doing the Norwoods, doing the very complex cases, and we really have to learn how to resist the urge to get carried away by it, the complex cases. So it's important to educate the team on the rest, the rest of the team on the picture, and learning to say no to a certain very specific complex situation if you're denying somebody else basic care. There are challenges to sustainability, the biggest challenge is training surgeons, the biggest challenge, because there aren't enough of them, and we haven't done a good job of that. Challenges to sustain support from the institution, sustaining commitment. The next generation may not work as hard. Retaining staff nurses is incredibly difficult, and sustaining the flow of subsidies. You can't continuously subsidize congenital heart surgery. And this is the real hard part, to find the balance between resources and outcome. We started our program with a 20% neonatal cardiac surgical mortality. We were down to 2.3%. And at the same time, we deployed resources without realizing that we were going to increase the cost of care considerably. Somewhere here was a sweet spot that we missed. And we are expensive now. And it's very hard to convince everybody about this balance. To find this balance is really tricky. So that's another challenge. So to conclude, the term limited resource is a relative one. We could never have enough. All of us actually will need to work with fewer and fewer resources with rising healthcare costs. And the essential core is really to acquire the mindset to reach out to the average child in the region. And innovations will happen. It's just inevitable. 
Thank you.